CPA. Michael, thank you very much. And uh, this has been an unusual day. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee is convening as we speak on uh, legislation concerning Ukraine. So I really have to go back up to the committee. We have, uh, uh, we hope to pass out of the Foreign Relations Committee a pretty strong bill that will deal with not only uh, economic assistance, but also with sanctions and IMF reform. And IMF reform is critically important for the United States to get done. So um, you'll, I'll have to excuse myself. But to Professor Gratz, I want to first thank him for um, the, um, uh, his work that he's done in this field. He is the expert uh, and uh, gives a great deal of credibility to those of us who have been pointing out for a long time that when you think about the U.S. tax revenues, where we get our revenues from, you realize how stubborn America is. We can continue to be that way. Of all the industrial nations in the world, we're near the bottom as far as our reliance on government services and the amount of revenues we collect for government purposes as a percentage of our economy. We're near the bottom. Yet we have the highest marginal tax rates in the industrial world because we rely on income and the rest of the world relies on consumption. And we did this because we were Americans and we didn't feel that we would pay a heavy price in international commerce because we're so strong. Well, we're in a strong global competitive market and our tax structure does affect our ability for American companies to be able to compete effectively and it's costing us jobs here in America. As you know, consumption taxes are border adjusted, income taxes are not border adjusted. So we passed tax reform in 1986. I was not in Congress when that happened. And it was an effort to flatten the, um, the spread the risk and flatten the rates. Sounds familiar. The same goals of tax reform in 2014. The efforts in, 20, uh, in, in 1986 were hailed as one of the great achievements in tax reform, tax simplification. 1986 was the last year I could do my own personal income tax returns. <laughs> and I really under, I thought I, I'm the, on the tax writing committee, I should be able to do this. It was the last year. Tax reform survived for almost one year before it was changed. So those who think you're going to get predictability with tax reform under this current regime, it's not going to happen. You're going to get temporary provisions. You're going to get changes. Every time there's an issue that comes up that can't be resolved in the budget, they'll come to the tax code. As a result, we have literally hundreds of temporary provisions and changes and thousands, tens of thousands of changes to the tax code since 1986. And it's as complex as ever. We depend upon voluntary compliance primarily. I know we have all the reporting, but we expect Americans to do the right thing. And they primarily will if they think they're being treated fairly. But they don't think they're being treated fairly, so they push the envelope as far as they can. This has to change. So the only, and you saw Congressman Camp, give him a lot of credit, brave guy, brave guy. There's absolutely no chance his proposal will become law, but give him credit for putting forward a credible proposal. He made a lot of enemies. Tax reform under the parameters set by the, the, the leadership will create winners and losers, and politically, Winners, remember your name for about two days. Losers, never forget who you are if you vote for it. So it's not going to be easy to get any type of significant tax reform done under the current regime. And if we get it done, it won't last very long. So I strongly support a progressive consumption tax. I've been for this since I came to Congress in 1987. I read an article about it a long time ago. I'm for it for many, many reasons. But principally, I believe it will give us predictability. You'll be able to know that if we get this done, it will give us the type of structure where people can compete. And P Professor Gratz has made it clear that this can be a progressive consumption tax. And one of the, the things that we are committed to doing is to make sure it's at least as progressive as the current tax code. We think we can make it more progressive than the current tax code. So this year, I intend to file a progressive consumption tax. It's not easy to get it drafted. We're drafting it. And it's not easy to get it scored. 
And Senator Baucus and now Senator Wyden are helping me make sure we get it scored so we have a bill that we can actually talk about that joint taxes actually said will produce the results that we say it will produce. And we're going through all the transitional problems right now. And there are a lot of transitional problems. I acknowledge that. But far less than the transitional problems we had in 1986. Far less. Uh, the, we believe at the end of the day, we can have the lowest corporate tax rates among the industrial nations, or approximately 15%. We can have the lowest uh, marginal income tax rates, a high of 25% for those over approximately $400,000 joint returns. We can exempt about 90% of the people from income tax. We will have immediate help for the consumption tax, either through payroll tax deductions or a debit card, so that individuals at approximately $25,000 of consumption or less will pay no consumption taxes and phased out over the next $25,000. We believe we can significantly simplify both the corporate and individual income taxes. On the individual side, we will preserve deductions for charities, for state and local, for real estate and for uh, health and pension benefits. And that's primarily the only exemptions. And on the consumption tax, we expect it will apply to every cons consumption with the sole exception of government. And we're going to stay pretty pure to those numbers so we can get it to the percentages I just said and keep the progressivity of it. And joint tax is working with us recognizing that the goal is to make sure that the progressivity is at least as great, if not greater, than current tax code. We have bipartisan support. Uh, I've talked with many Republicans. They've asked that I incorporate a provision that I intend to do that will put a circuit breaker in the consumption tax so that it will not raise more revenue than we say it's going to raise. If we do, then there'll be adjustments of rates. So there will be no argument that this is just going to be a money machine for the government. We set the revenues at whatever number we want to set it at, and we get it done. Uh, as you can see, I'm pretty excited about this. This bill will not be signed by President Obama in 2014. It's not going to happen. I recognize that. I do believe that come 2015, with the next Congress, that we can have a serious discussion about tax reform. We're not going to get tax reform in this Congress. I feel very badly about that. I've worked for it. I've worked for it. We can't get the progressive consumption tax. I'm for fixing as much of this tax code as we can. And I'm working on that. But I believe in 2015 we'll get into a serious discussion of what we're going to do on a grand bargain, how we're going to put deal with our long-term budget needs, and the tax code has to be part of that discussion. And I believe progressive consumption taxes can be part of that debate. So I'm very pleased that you all are here. Uh, this has been a long time coming. I haven't found too many group meetings where I've been invited to talk about a consumption tax. In fact, I think this is my first. <laughs> so let's make sure it's not the last. And uh, we need your help. We need your input. And the purer that we can stay on this with the goals that have been outlined, I think the stronger our proposal will be. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to say a few words uh, uh, by way of introduction while Michael is getting this slide so that you can actually see them. Um, I have a lot of slides. Uh, but, um, and, and much of what I say will actually echo what Senator Cardin said, um, for which I am grateful. Um, <clears throat> let me say this, that the coda, so the coda for today uh, is uh, Robert Frost, uh, The Road Not Taken. And I want to read three lines. It's a very misunderstood poem although his most famous probably, or second most famous, and I'll read three lines. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The sigh is important. People often uh, misunderstand the poem by reading through it too quickly. So, what are the road that we took? So, I can go back to the time before World War II when we had a consumption tax. It was a bad form of consumption tax. It was tariffs. 
We had a consumption tax and a high and an income tax that was limited to high income individuals. And the income tax was enacted after the 16th Amendment to achieve progressivity in the tax system. That is, it was for justice that we came to an income tax, but it was limited to high income people. Uh, during the Second World War, Franklin Roosevelt considered a uh, consumption tax uh, in order to finance the war. Uh, the Congress considered it, but unfortunately, I think, you can sigh uh, often in this story, but I'll try and limit my sighs. Um, unfortunately, uh, we went uh, and extended the income tax to the masses. Uh, and uh, that uh, was true in the Second World War. And during the period of 1950s through the 1960s, we had an income tax with rates as high as 91%. Now, it didn't hurt us. We grew at a great rate. But the world was very different then. Europe was a shambles. Japan uh, was coming out of a, a very uh, horrible uh, situation after the war. And China was embarking on a dark communist period from which they have only recently emerged. Uh, three decades ago, in 1986, as Senator Cardin said, uh, Ronald Reagan and his economists and uh, advisors at the Treasury Department uh, decided not to go down the path of consumption taxation, but instead uh, to uh, engage in the 1986 tax reform. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, said, uh, this always reminds me of a Tennessee Williams play, when somebody says something and you know they mean it, but there's something not quite right about it. He said it was the best anti-poverty measure, the best pro-family measure, and the best job creation member measure ever to come out of the Congress of the United States. A little hyperbole, I think, there. In any event, as Senator Cardin said, it wasn't a year before it started unraveling. It has unraveled with thousands and thousands of tax amendments over and over again, um, to the point where we now have um, uh, narrowed the base and, and raised the rates. Uh, and Ronald Reagan, it should be remembered, was able to lower rates from 70% when he came into office to 28% when he left office. And he had a pot of gold to finance tax reform with. That was the repeal of the investment tax credit and tax shelters that had been marketed throughout the nation to high income individuals. Here we are, three decades later, and Congressman Camp, and I'm with Senator Cardin, Congressman Camp deserves a lot of credit, Congressman Camp has just put out a new tax reform bill, which is an effort to stay on the path of relying on the income tax and to reprise the 86 Act. And, uh, and he got the rates down from 40% uh, uh, to, he says, 25% with a 10% surtax. I would tell my students that that sounds a lot like 35% to me. Uh, but, uh, you know, going from 40 uh, to 35 percent and in the process uh, goring uh, many sacred cows, including the home mortgage interest deduction, charitable contributions, and so forth, um, it, it is not likely to pass. And if it passes, as Senator Cardin says, it's not going to stay in place for long. Secondly, and I just want to mention this briefly, but I was talking to some tax economists this morning, and I accused them of this, so I might as well tell you about it. Um, the economics profession took a strange path itself, a path not taken. And that was, it recognized that we needed a consumption tax. It recognized that we should have a consumption tax. But they became enamored of very odd methods of consumption taxation that are not used anywhere in the world. Uh, these include things like an expenditure tax, uh, which was uh, actually introduced by uh, Senators Nunn and Domenici back in the day, um, uh, something that David Bradford called an X tax, which is a variation of Bob Hall and uh, Alvin Rabushka's uh, flat tax with progressive rates on wages. Uh, George Bush uh, created a tax reform panel in 2005 
And that panel was composed of very uh, able politicians, uh, uh, headed by uh, John Bro, a Democrat from Louisiana, and Connie Mack, a, 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 a former senator from Florida, a Republican senator from Florida, had on it some of the best economists I know, people like Jim Paterba and Ed Lazier. Uh, they did an awful lot of work. They had a lot of staff. There is a, a moment in which John Bro is in the White House and with in the Orville office with uh, George Bush himself only, and he starts opening cabinets, and, and the president says to Bro, what are you doing? And Bro says, well, I'm looking for my panel's tax reform report because it must have gotten lost on the way over to the White House. Um, and, and so it was uh, consigned to oblivion, as Bro suggested, but I want to tell you about two pieces of it before I get into these slides. Because I think it injected two important pieces of reality into the tax reform discussion, both of which are largely unknown because nobody even knows that panel existed except those of us who are watching closely. One is that they came up with a, a variation of the flat tax with progressive rates, a variation of the uh, X tax, but they called it the growth and investment tax, but of course it wasn't a tax on growth and investment. Um, but they coupled that tax, that consumption tax, with a 15% rate tax on interest, dividends, and capital gains. And it was a recognition that you cannot, in the United States, tax only wages and have a system that people are going to think is fair. And if that was true in that conservative panel 10 years ago, it's much more true today. I, I live in New York City where the current mayor is making it all too true uh, today. But, uh, uh, but having said that, um, inequality and the public and, and politicians' attention to inequality means that you have to have a, a tax on capital income as well as on consumption and, and wages in, in the system in order for it to be fair. And then the second thing, and I'll be quick about this, that they did, but this is very important for the border adjustment piece of this story, is they concluded that in order to make this consumption tax work, not for economic reasons, but just to make it uh, able to be complied with, that it had to be border adjusted. Um, their consumption tax, as they, as they concluded and they confessed, I always say confessed, they used different verbs, as they confessed, was not compliant with either our trade agreements or our bilateral tax agreements. And so there is in that report a little notion that says, well, in addition to getting this through Congress and signed by the president, of course, we have to renegotiate all of our trade and tax treaties. Uh, this, I think, is why it's in the dustbin uh, and nobody's reading it. That is, you can't endorse a proposal that requires that kind of adjustment in our international uh, arrangements. Um, and then the last thing I'll say before I get to the slides, and, and I'll get to the slides and go through them reasonably quickly in order to give you a chance to ask questions and so forth. But, um, oops, I don't know what I did, Michael. There we go. Um, um, the, uh, in 1992, when I was at the Treasury, we put out a report about integrating the corporate tax and the individual tax into one tax instead of a double tax. And we chose for administrative reasons in 1992 to put the tax at the corporate level, not at the individual level. And you've seen this was a proposal that George uh, W. Bush uh, reintroduced in, in, in his uh, 2003 proposals. We did not know, even as recently as 1992, how the international economy was going to unfold, and how, I mean, remember, it's only three years after the, uh, after the, after the fall of, of the USSR, and uh, uh, we did not see that if you want progressivity in a tax system, you can't do it by taxing large businesses. You have to do it by taxing individuals who are much less mobile and are able to stay. And so I now say, if we were right then, we're wrong now. The internationalization of the economy has to be at the center of this tax reform discussion, and it has been at the periphery. 
of the politician's view. And this is a mistake, and if you look ahead, this is going to become a more and more costly mistake for the United States going forward. I'm happy to come back to that. Um, and if you ask what is the issue on which the House Democrats and the Senate Democrats on the one hand and the House Republicans and, and many uh, Republicans in the Senate disagree on the most, it is how to tax U.S. multinational uh, companies, whether to tax them on their worldwide income or whether to tax them only on their domestic income. And we have to get to a point where that question disappears in some sense. And that's a very important piece of the proposal that I'm about to describe to you. Now, I will say one other thing. This proposal uh, was scored by the Tax Policy Center. Those of you who follow this know that the Tax Policy Center is a nonpartisan organization that scores uh, presidential candidates' uh, uh, proposals and the like, but rarely uh, one of an individual. They got a grant from the Pew Charitable Trust to do this work. Uh, they had put out a paper in January of 2012 in which they scored it. But then it was rescored in November of uh, last year, 2013, after the fiscal cliff, after the uh, baseline got settled, after we knew what happened to the Bush tax cuts. And it is the 2000, it's the current numbers, it's scored now for 2015. It's the current numbers, which I'm about to give you, and they're not my numbers, they're the uh, Tax Policy Center numbers, which is important because they are uh, credible and they have computers. Let me give you a few slides. This is, um, this is the 160. There are now more than 160 countries that have a value-added tax. The colors are, are when they adopted uh, these value-added taxes. A lot of them are in the 90s. Uh, so the red, a handful of red uh, countries have just adopted them very recently. Uh, you will see that there are still a few countries in the Middle East uh, that are able to uh, live off their oil uh, revenues, and a few sub-Saharan uh, countries that do not have value-added taxes. And then there are three very large countries over here in gray on the, on the left that do not have value-added taxes. That is Greenland, uh, the United States, and Alaska. Um, uh, uh, those, those, those are the three gray countries. Um, and, and, and so the United States is the only important player in the world not to have a value-added tax. And if such a tax can be administered by uh, sub-Saharan African countries and Sri Lanka, I believe that it can be administered by the United States. Um, this is just, I'm going to run through these next few slides quickly because uh, Senator Cardin just told you this. Total taxes as, as a percentage of GDP, the U.S. is a low-tax country. We don't like to think of ourselves that way. We don't tend to know that, but we are a low-tax country as compared to the OECD and uh, the EU. I don't know why every time I move this, something happens, but I'll, I'm going to, I'm not, I'm not going to move it. I'm not going to move it. No, that's state, federal, state, and, and local, and for all the countries, and for all the countries. So Switzerland uh, has state taxes, Germany has state taxes. It's, 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 it's all branches of government. Sorry? Yes. Yes. Includes payroll tax. Uh, the income tax, as you see here, as a percentage of GDP, however, is basically the same uh, as the OECD and, and the EU, which means that we're not a low-income tax country. So there, there you have it. That's, that's the point that uh, uh, Senator uh, Cardin just made. And here we have uh, consumption taxes as a percentage of GDP, and you see the U.S. is, is very small relative to the OECD or the EU. Uh, and as a percentage of total taxation, the U.S. is very small. Even as a low-tax country, our reliance on consumption taxes is much lower than it is uh, for other countries. Um, and, uh, um, and so that is the big difference. That is, if you ask what's the big difference between the U.S. tax system and others, our income taxes are about the same. Our payroll taxes are actually about the same. Our consumption taxes are much lower. That's why we're a low-tax country, but we're not taking advantage of our status as a low-tax country. Okay, and then I want to describe the plan that, that I have. You know, I've got a detailed plan, and Senator Cardin's working out a plan, um, and his scoring will be by the Joint Committee on Taxation, and my scoring is by the Tax Policy Center because I don't have access to the Joint Committee on Taxation. But, um, but here it is, and, and I think these, these numbers are, are pretty solid. And so the... 
There are five pieces I describe here. They will sound a little familiar, I think, given what Senator Cardin said. The first is to enact a VAT. Uh, many English-speaking countries call it a goods and services tax, which I suspect we need to do. The second piece is to use the revenue from this value-added tax. Now, the goal here, and you will see I succeed in this, is to start with a revenue-neutral and distributionally-neutral proposal. So the idea is let's compare it to the current system. He says you can get more progressivity. Uh, some people want more progressivity. Some people want more revenue. Some people want neither. Um, I'm just comparing apples to apples, this system to the current system. I use the revenue, uh, the revenue from this uh, value-added tax to uh, finance an income tax exemption of $100,000 family income. It's $100,000 for married couples, seventy-five for heads of household, and fifty for singles. But I will just do married couples here. Um, and that frees 120 million American, uh, uh, it eliminates 120 million returns. It's actually about 150 million families because a lot of those are joint returns. I will say, having written a book on this topic and urged this proposal without these numbers, um, I uh, breathed the great sigh of relief uh, when the uh, Tax Policy Center concluded uh, that it wasn't 98 million returns because I had entitled the book 100 million unnecessary returns and it would have been embarrassing if it was 98 but at 120 I'm quite comfortable. Uh, the other numbers are more important than that to others but to me the, the 100 million was an important number. Yes, this is inflation adjusted. Um, third, uh, lower the corporate rate to 15 percent. Now this is worth stopping for a moment on. Um, I say 15%. What's interesting about Congressman Camp's proposal is that if you look at it, he has a tax actually that uh, seems, could be described, let me put it this way, could be described as a minimum tax. And the minimum tax is about 15% on what he calls intangible income that's earned abroad. And it's 12.5% on what's known to us tax people as foreign-based company sales income. And, and that's the Irish rate. And so, you know, 12 and a half or 15, he's basically taxing worldwide income. Even though he's got a, a participation exemption, a dividend exemption system, he's got a minimum tax of 12 and a half or 15 percent on foreign uh, income. And, uh, and I did this 15 percent rate on the grounds that I needed a rate that was low enough that this debate about whether to have a dividend exemption system and only tax U.S. source income or whether to tax worldwide income didn't make a whole lot of difference. And it is the statutory rate, one more point here about this before I go on, it is the statutory rate that is important because deductions flow to high tax countries and income flows to low tax countries. And, uh, and therefore we've got great incentives for borrowing here uh, and deducting the interest against our high tax 35% uh, rate and people having their income taxed somewhere else. The OECD is engaged in a project called uh, BEPS, Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, uh, in which their plan, at least as they've gotten to it so far, would be to have the tax follow where the key employees are. And so now U.S. multinationals are able to shift their intangible income abroad without doing much else. It's mostly paper transactions. I don't want to get in great detail about it. But you don't have to have a lot of employees uh, located in places like Ireland, certainly not the Caymans or, or Bahamas or, or Bermuda or Singapore or Switzerland in order to get the low rate. If the employees have to be located there in order to get the low rate, you're going to see a lot more research and development in those low tax countries. You already see it in Switzerland. And you're going to see a lot more movement of jobs uh, as well as income, in my view. So I think this is, this is very important going forward. Uh, you, have, uh, you have the ministers of the G20 company, countries, people like David Cameron now talking about international tax, the German foreign min finance minister, the, the Prime Minister of Italy, the previous Prime Minister, it's a new Prime Minister of Italy every time we turn around, but the, the previous Prime Minister of Italy talking about it. And so when it gets to the Prime Minister level, uh, in England it was Google, Amazon, and Starbucks that they focused on, uh, but when it gets to the Prime Minister level, this something's going to happen internationally, globally. 
I'll come back to this if you want. Uh, fourth, I want to protect uh, low and moderate income workers from a tax increase through payroll tax cuts. And I want to protect low and moderate income families from a tax increase through refundable tax credits for children delivered through debit cards that will forgive the tax at the, ta at the cash register. So this sounds a little bit like what Senator Cardin was saying too, although I'm sure the parameters are different. Uh, the proposed VAT is 12.9% a a, a uh, value-added tax. Uh, when you add that to the state uh, sales taxes, there are a few federal excise taxes in here as well, you get a consumption tax that's about at the OECD level and below the uh, European level of consumption taxes, uh, which means, you know, you could possibly raise the consumption tax a little bit if you needed more revenue, but you can't raise it much uh, because the Europeans in particular are getting uh, uh, close to the limit. And as a percentage of GDP, it puts the U.S. higher in its reliance on consumption taxes, light, slightly higher. We're not talking about much difference, but slightly higher than... Uh, Europe or the OECD. The income tax, uh, these are the parameters of the income tax. So the income tax basically would return to its pre-World War II status as a tax uh, designed to get progressivity into the system, limited to high income individuals. As I said, you'd have a hundred thousand dollar exemption for married couples. Uh, more than 120 million tax returns disappear from the system. 20% of all uh, tax units are required. 80% of, of all tax units are out of the income tax. Uh, and I have to say, in terms of stability, since Senator Cardin mentioned it, uh, nobody's going to get up on the floor of the Senate and say, let's lower that exemption and bring those people back into the income tax. That is not a political winner. Um, the rates above that threshold are 14% between 100 and 200,000. 27% between 200 and 600,000, and 31% above uh, 600,000. These were the numbers that were necessary in order to keep uh, the distribution at the very top uh, the same. You'll see those numbers in a minute. And it repeals the AMT, and it also repeals the 3.8% surtax on investment income. Uh, Congressman Camp was not able to do that. And obviously, I can have lower rates if I keep that 3.8% tax, but I didn't keep it. I, I understand the politics of keeping it. This is just the Tax Policy Center estimates of income tax as compared to current law. The blue line is current law. The dotted line is the, is the, is the proposal. You see there is no income tax up to 100, but for everyone, their income tax is much less than it is under current, under current law. So everybody gets an income tax a reduction, not surprising because they're going to have to pay consumption taxes. Uh, the number of individual filers, so these are the filers under current law. Uh, these are uh, all tax units, which include non-filers. This is just the number of filers, which is about 150 million. Here you get uh, income tax filers, and then uh, self-employed individuals have to file a form because uh, you've got to collect the payroll tax from them directly. These are the total tax returns, including the value-added tax returns business income tax returns, individual income tax returns, and the self-employed tax returns that I mentioned uh, under the proposal as compared to the 2015 uh, income tax returns that are, that are being filed. So the IRS can do its job. I should say that I include in the, in the Tax Policy Center's version of this an exemption for small businesses under 500,000. I wanted to include a million under a million. You can do it under a million. It doesn't lose much money and it takes more businesses out of the system. You can elect in if you, if you want to get the credits. But, but, but um, um, I also wanted to keep the rate below 13%. And so if, it had stayed, if I'd gone to a million, I would have had to go to about 13.1 instead of 12.9. But it's not much money. And if we ever got serious, I'd, I'd like to see that go up. Um, the corporate uh, proposal I mentioned, you've got a 15% rate. You repeal the uh, uh, corporate alternative minimum tax. You broaden the corporate base a bit. I eliminated all credits except for the foreign tax credit. Um, I think that you've got to rethink the treatment of partnerships uh, in the United States. I I've said this many times, but I think that I mean, you've got very large companies, now companies, you've got very large businesses now operating as partnerships. 
What's changed is that you can become very large by going to private equity and sovereign wealth funds. And, you, and if you don't have to go to the public equity market, there's no reason to be a corporation. And so um, um, you needed to do it to get capital in the old days, but now you can get capital from private sources. And, uh, and, and if you look at the amount of business income now from large partnerships, very large partnerships, uh, you'll find that it's just uh, out of line with anything we've experienced before. Uh, and then you can dramatically simplify the taxation of small businesses because you know, they're not, the ones with income under $100,000 aren't going to even be bothered with, uh, with this tax. And there's just a lot you can do. Uh, this shows the composition of revenues under current law and under the proposal, you see the corporate tax, which is in the green, uh, has gone down dramatically. The value-added tax, of course, is the yellow, and the income tax has gotten much, much smaller. Um, this is uh, income tax revenue. This shows you what I've done for the income tax. This is income tax revenue as a percentage of GDP. This is a 2005. This is the OECD, the EU. This is the U.S. 2015. It's estimated. And this is the U.S. under the proposal. So the income tax gets much smaller uh, as a percentage of GDP, not surprisingly. Uh, the child credits, I won't spend a lot of time on this because I, I want to get through it, but I'll, I'll uh, um, just mention it. Everybody, all children get uh, $1,500 a child. Uh, there is a phase out, but it's above the income tax levels. And so it's $150,000 for a married couple. And that means you can collect it through a small uh, additional rate on the income tax, a little bubble rate that lasts a little bit. And it's phased out here at a 5% rate for people over 150000 through the income tax. And then low and moderate income workers get a rebate of up to 3500 for one child, 5200 for two or more. And then it is phased out um, uh, as wages increase, but all you need to know is wages. If wages don't get up above a certain level, uh, the phase out doesn't apply. Uh, the payroll tax piece of this is a credit for 15.3% of wages up to $10,000, and then $1,530 a credit for workers between uh, 10,000 and 40,000. And what this means, obviously, is that there are no payroll taxes for workers with income below 10,000. Uh, the employee share disappears up to 20,000, and a quarter of the total disappears uh, up to 40,000, and then it phases out at the 7.65% payroll tax uh, rate above $40,000. So you've got a, 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 a fairly large payroll tax reduction built in here. Um, these are deficit uh, neutrality numbers. I, I only want to, uh, to mention two numbers. Zero at the bottom, which is that it is deficit neutral. That's the, the key point. The other is there is in here a change in a grant to state and local governments. Uh, and that's because I actually have become convinced that you need to include value added taxes on, on, on most purchases by state and local governments in order to make this work. Otherwise, you're creating a great incentive for them doing services themselves rather than contracting out uh, things like waste disposal and the like, which they do a lot of. Um, this is more detail on the revenue numbers, which I'll spare you unless you really want to see it. Uh, this is the distributional analysis that shows that it's distributionally neutral. Um, I think it's easier to see on the picture than it is on the numbers, and so I'll give you the picture. Um, so this is, these are relatively small numbers. So this negative number is 1%, and the, and the top number is 1.5%. And this is changes in after-tax income, uh, as estimated by the Tax Policy Center. And what you see is that the top four, the bottom four quintiles have an increase in after-tax income, which means their tax burden has gone down. And then the top quintile has a decrease in their after-tax income, which means that their tax burden has gone up. So it's slightly more progressive than current law. These are not big numbers. Uh, and then you see uh, that the largest is that uh, the top one-tenth of 1% 1 uh, pay 0.9% uh, more taxes. So this is, in fact, more progressive than the current system. But given the uh, 
small uh, size of these numbers, it's, uh, it's, it's better to call it distributionally neutral. Um, I'm now almost done. I just want to go through the advantages of the plan. Um, it obviously takes advantage of our status as a low-tax country by making us a low-income tax country. Uh, most Americans would owe no tax on their savings and investment, uh, and everyone would have a tax cut on their savings and investment. Over the longer term, and this I think is, is made clear by the camp scoring, that is the Joint Committee did some dynamic storing of, of camps bill, and all economists will tell you this has more uh, economic growth than his proposal. We just don't know how much because I can't get it scored without paying the scorekeeper uh, a lot of money or getting Senator Cardin to insist on it, which I might try to do, or somebody else uh, on, the, on the Senate uh, or the House. Uh, but what's clear is that uh, uh, the U.S. would be a much more favorable place for savings, investment, economic growth. Economic growth would be, uh, would be better. Uh, the vast majority of Americans would never have to deal with the IRS, uh, which I think you'll find that they would embrace. Um, and then by returning the income tax to its pre-World War II role as a relatively small tax on a thin slice of high-income Americans, there would be no temptation for Congress to think that it can solve the nation's big social and economic problems through tax provisions. And so, um, you know, we tried to do health insurance that way through employer-provided health insurance. We've tried to do retirement insurance that way. There have been some successes. It's not the complete failure. I, I always use education. Funding higher education is my example here where no uh, middle-income uh, family can figure out what the credits do or the Coverdale accounts. I've tried to teach this in two hours. To, I tried it when I was at Yale to teach it to Yale law students who are uh, smarter than the average bear in two hours, and they could, and they worked on it, and they couldn't, they couldn't, it couldn't be done in two hours. And so if they couldn't do it, I don't think you can plan your higher education that way. But, uh, but it, it, it eliminates the temptation because you're not going to target this just to high income people, you're going to have to find real solutions to these problems. We've tried the tax thing and it doesn't work. Uh, now I get, I think, to some of the things that you people care about a lot. One is that unlike other uh, unique consumption tax proposals, this proposal fits well with international existing international tax and trade treaties. That is to say, the value-added tax is border adjustable. And it's border adjustable without doing anything except saying it's border adjustable because it fits well with our obligations. Uh, as I mentioned, a 14, a 15 percent corporate rate, I think, solves problems uh, of the international tax system, problems that I will say, having spent a lot of time in writing on international tax in the last 15 years or so, I am uh, pessimistic about solving in other ways, because I think you're going to see a lot of countries grabbing for revenues from each other. Uh, that's what's going to happen um, in this OECD project. Uh, the, the UK is going to say, we get to tax Google, Starbucks, and Amazon, and we're going to say, no, we get to tax Google, Starbucks, and Amazon, and everybody else is going to say the same. The French have now decided that just providing data to Google is a basis for taxing Google. So that's a new one, but uh, there you see it. Um, now, by taxing imports and exempting exports, and this I think is very important, you get hundreds of billions of dollars for the U.S. Treasury from sales of products made abroad. So that whatever you want to say about the economics of this and whether the currencies will adjust or not, which I'll leave to Joe, the revenue is coming in. That is, if you just look at the trade balance and you look at projected trade balances, at least in the decade ahead, it's about $700 billion at a 12.9% rate that you're getting from imports. And that is a huge shift of the burden away from production domestically to uh, production abroad. Um, and then uh, this is an interesting point that has been overlooked because it only recent research involving New Zealand and Japan that has revealed this, although it makes common sense, and that is it takes 18 months to two years from the time a VAT is enacted in order for it to actually be collected. And during that time, not surprisingly, people accelerate their uh, purchases of uh, consumer goods, including consumer durables, so cars, refrigerators, uh, uh, those kinds of items. 
And, uh, and that provides a very uh, important, I think, in the current climate, short-term boost to the economy in the context of a proposal that provides also a very important long-term boost to the economy. So it actually has both short-term and long-term uh, advantages. And then the last thing I would say is that 1986 tax reform, in my view, is a dead end. That's the pathway. Just to come back, I'll sigh once more at the end. Uh, just to come back to the path not taken, I, I think that, uh, uh, that that path is a dead end. And, uh, and for all of the work that Congress and Congressman Camp and the staff and others uh, will do and try to do to make it uh, to, to, to resurrect it, if you will, or reprise it, if you will, I, uh, I think it's a dead end because we know the minute it happens, assuming it actually happens, it'll start uh, coming unraveled and people will start uh, 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 once again getting their tax advantages. And so with that, I'll stop. Well, uh, thanks, Michael. And I will be brief. I don't have a presentation. I'm not a tax expert. Uh, I, I do know something about exchange rates and trade balances. Um, so in terms of what a consumption tax would mean for the U.S. trade balance, uh, there's two things to consider. And, and one of them, I think, is broad agreement among most economists. Uh, uh, one, one, there's two channels. There's two effects to consider. And, and uh, one of them, I think, has a lot of broad agreement among economists, and it would uh, lead to a uh, higher net exports for the U.S. if we switch to consumption tax. And, and the way it works is this. Basically, uh, if you can tax income, you can tax consumption. What's the difference? Saving. If you tax consumption more and income less, you will be giving an incentive for people to save. By encouraging people to save, you're going to be uh, lowering rates of return on assets in the U.S., which is going to depreciate the dollar which is then going to increase U.S. sales abroad. And it all hangs together because in order to save more in the U.S., we're going to need to borrow less from abroad because we'll be do doing more of the saving internally. We won't need to borrow as much abroad. And a trade deficit is borrowing from abroad. So as we save more, we will borrow less. Uh, that's the very definition of saving. And as we borrow less from the rest of the world, we'll have a, a smaller trade deficit. Uh, and the way that works is through the exchange rate. So. Uh, that's, I think, a channel that just about anyone I know in economics would agree on, and it seems to cut across all the different types of proposals for consumption tax, whether it's based on uh, value-added tax or goods and services tax, or whether it's based through the income system where you can deduct savings, that was some of the thing you mentioned. Uh, that effect is sort of doesn't matter, and it doesn't matter that much how, if it's revenue neutral or offset, well, of course, if it's not revenue neutral, then it's, uh, it's going to have a bigger effect, but I think we think revenue neutral is sort of the, the, the benchmark we should go from. Well, that's the second point. So, so that's one in which it doesn't matter, and all economists would agree, and it, will, it will, should approve the trade uh, balance over time. The other thing, though, is, is the border adjustment. Does it, you know, do we go through border adjustments? How do we go through border adjustments? Do we, what are, where are the offsetting taxes? And you got a flavor of that just now with the comment that, that you made, um, which is uh, because, especially in the short run, because, because prices tend to be sticky, but maybe even in a fairly longish run, uh, it seems to me that, uh, and this is, I think, where I'm going to be less, uh, there's less uh, consensus among economists. So, but uh, it seems to me that, if you do the offset from this consumption revenue through uh, things that reduce the cost of doing business, such as payroll taxes paid by employers or healthcare costs paid by employers, then that will lower the cost of exports to the rest of the world because our costs go down. Right. And, and exports aren't being taxed by the, the uh, consumption tax, so you know, that, that cost won't be offset by another tax increase, so it should lower uh, cost of exports, it should help trade. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you do it the way that Professor Gratz was saying, where you really are just going to do the offset on income, people's income side, then you're not going to be lowering the cost that you face in doing business as much. And so there'll be less of a benefit. 
There'd still be the benefit, the other benefit I told you, which is that because we're saving more because the dollar will fall, uh, that will help you. But this is a separate channel. And that channel will be greater or lesser depending on how you do the offsets. And that's, I think, a policy decision we have to think about. The benefit of some of the things Professor Gratz says, I think, is simplification of our tax system and progress progressivity and fairness um, versus do we want more balanced trade. So I think those are, and I don't want to weigh in, I don't have a strong view on that, but I think we should, we should consider that. But, but regardless of how you do that, I still think the, fir the first channel is still going to be operational. Now, some economists say, well, uh, even if you did lower employers' costs uh, through the offsetting tax cuts, maybe the dollar will rise, uh, because, uh, th and that will offset some of those gains. Uh, but the models in which the dollar would rise are really relying quite strongly on markets being really perfectly efficient. And I think certainly my confidence in the efficiency of markets has fallen a lot in the past 10 years. Maybe many of yours has too. They really rely heavily on these sort of really extreme um, assumptions, theoretically, to make them work. So I have a lot of you know, doubt, it seems to me, that if it did happen, it would take time for the markets to figure out you know, where that was going to happen and if it ever happened fully. Uh, and also, the other thing is that even these models, even, with their, even in their pure form, even in these, these economists who would say that, are missing one important thing, which is these models that drive these results always assume that we don't own any foreign assets and foreigners don't own any assets in the US. They always take that as a simplifying assumption. Turns out, once you relax that and recognize that we actually own a hell of a lot of foreign assets and a lot of foreigners own a lot of assets in America, any exchange rate movement that tries to offset some of this uh, advantage from the lower costs is going to have offsetting wealth effects, which damp it down. Basically, what happens is if the dollar were to rise because to offset the cost benefits you get, that would lower the value of American savings abroad and further increase U.S. savings, which would further put downward pressure on the dollar again. So it sort of is sort of going to offset it. So, so in other words, they're not considering these offsets on offsets, uh, which uh, strikes me as most unlikely um, that, uh, that you could offset these benefits. So the bottom line is, just to, to finish, there are two channels which will be at work, one which we all agree on pretty much, uh, and independent of that one, that is just the consumption, favoring saving, encouraging saving in the US, making the dollar go down, lowering our costs relative to the rest of the world. That definitely works, we all agree. The other one though, whether taxing imports uh, through consumption tax and, and not taxing exports then tilts the playing field, uh, that, that's trickier. And it's, as I think someone mentioned, I mean, yes, we're going to be taxing, taxing imports under this proposal, but we'll be taxing domestic production too because both will be taxed by a consumption tax. Uh, and we won't be taxing exports, but that's not a difference from before. So, so, so that border adjustment per se isn't really the key, I don't think. It's, it's what you actually do with the revenue. Do you use it to reduce costs of business in America, in which case you probably have a further benefit to exports, or do you use it to benefit households in their income? In which case, there probably wouldn't be.